All right, if you have your Bibles today, I want you to take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 26 with me if you would do that. And as you're going to Matthew chapter 26, let's just go ahead and say it together. Lord, Lord may, the may the word change me. I want to tell you today in this room, no matter your circumstance, no matter where you are in life, he is not finished with you yet. Tell, go ahead. Oh, come on now. Somebody just tell your neighbor, he's not finished with me. Now tell somebody else on the other side, he's not finished with me yet. I know some of you have been going through some rough times, and some of you think sometimes that God's forgotten about you, maybe abandoned you, but I'm going to promise you by the end of this day that if you will let hope rise up in your spirit, that you too will believe he's not finished with me. He's not finished with me. I may feel like giving up on myself, but thank God he's not finished with me yet. Amen? As, you're, as you put your finger in Matthew chapter 26, let me start in Matthew 4, 18 and 20. And it would say this, look on the screen. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting their net into the sea, for they were what? Fishermen. Fishermen. And he said to them two words, follow me. Everybody say, follow me. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. It's a good day in your life when the Lord calls you to anything and says, follow me. Follow after me. Let's forward about three and a half years into Matthew chapter 26, verse 33 and 35, and it would say this, and, and Peter answered him and said, this is the last supper, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. I'm going to tell you something this morning. If Jesus says something, it's going to come to pass. It's going to happen. We have a calling here. Now stay in Matthew chapter 26. We have a calling from the Lord Jesus Christ that says, follow me. And then we have three and a half years later that the Lord is sitting at the last table, the last supper. And we know from last week that this is the moment that Judas is identified as the betrayer. But just because Judas sold him for, for silver did not mean that Judas was the only one that would betray Jesus. <clears throat> it also says that Peter, Peter made a statement and said, Lord, no matter what takes place, I will not deny you. And G Jesus said before the rooster crows, three times you will deny me. And Peter, we've got some people in this room like Peter, you try to take it a step further. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. I'm sure that Peter thought, can, can you be serious? Can, can you actually? I'm sure that Peter thought, I've been the best disciple that you've had. How can you say that I will deny you? And, and so if you forward yourself just a couple hours now, Jesus has, has been arrested. He's brought, been brought before counsel and trial. It's late. You guys know this scene that, that all of a sudden Jesus has been arrested and it's late and everyone is filled with confusion. Everyone is filled with anger. The priest is yelling and the elders are mad and they need testimony against Jesus and and without proper testimony they they can't try him the way that they want to it even gets so bad that the elders and the priests begin to get false testimony it, it's bad when the elders and the priests are pulling people aside telling them I need you to say this but that's exactly what was happening they they were telling them how to testify falsely against Jesus. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. We, we live in a world where people are willing every day to testify falsely against Jesus. We have, we have people that have nothing, no idea who Jesus is. And I said it before. I'll say it again. But they'll stand on Pennsylvania Avenue holding a sign that says, if Mary would have had an abortion, we wouldn't have this problem. I'd like to tell that sad lady a story this morning. Even though... Oh, you, you hold a sign like that. His love even loves you. And, and even you, he's not finished with you yet. But, but they, were, they were saying you have to falsely testify. Now, now listen, the anger of this crowd 
had gotten to a climax. Everybody's mad. Jesus is arrested. And, and, and the priest is angry. The elders are angry. And the priest suddenly, furiously begins to rip their clothing. And, and they declared blasphemy. And, and, and we all know that sometimes if the priest declares blasphemy, that everybody else is just going to fall in line, they spit. Now, now I just want to take you to this scene. We've left Gethsemane. We've walked out of the garden. Now we are in the trial. I want you to understand that Jesus has been arrested. And as he stands there guiltless, as he stands there committing no crimes, they begin to spit in his face. They begin to slap him. They, they begin to pull out his beard. They begin to mock him. Can you, can you just walk into that scene? Just close your eyes and, and just imagine that this innocent man, that the, one after another, they are slapping him and mocking him and beating him. And it's clear by now that his face is beginning to swell, that his face is beginning to bruise. And, and the crowd's anger is now risen to a new level. They don't really know why they're mad. They don't really know what they're doing. They're just following the leaders. They're following the priest and they're following the elders. And at this time, Jesus is standing there. He's starting to bleed. Someone struck him under the eye and cut his eye. Why can they beat an innocent man? And his eye is beginning to swell. He's already show, showing bruising. And all of a sudden, somebody says, wait just a moment. Who, who, who is that over there? Who is, who is that over there? Follow me down to verse 69. And, and now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it. He what? He denied but he denied it before them saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another girl came and said to those that were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, but again, how many of you have ever said to God, Lord, but again? But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, a little later, uh, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Now look at verse 74. Then he began to curse. He began to curse and he began to swear. And he said, I do not know this man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Three times, Peter, it was predicted that he would do this very thing. And three times, people said, you are with Jesus. And, and Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. And it says, and the rooster crowed in verse 75. And Peter remembered the words that Jesus had said. Have any of you ever been in a bad time in your life? And you remembered the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and he wept bitterly. Suddenly, Peter's greatest fear became reality <laughs> when someone recognizes him and declares, you are with Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Instant fear Instant fear grips Peter as he refuses this charge, and he, re he even relocated himself in the crowd. Any, any of you ever feel like you need to relocate so that you can get away from the accusation? Peter even thought, if I relocate, then, then I'll get away from this one person that recognizes me. But, but if, I, if I don't relocate, then I'm going to be here. And those, those people know who I am. He even relocated. And even after relocating, the accusation still came. Someone still recognized him. But without hesitation, he declared his innocence once again. Fear and pressure demanded that he decline the accusation. Wouldn't you know it? Every mile that you try to run, it happens again. Anybody ever tried to run from something? Peter tried to move again. 
And it happened again, and someone said, you, you were with Jesus. Fearful intimidation overwhelms him as dreadful anger swells and instant distress. Anybody ever been there before? Comes with the imposed accusation. The pressure quickly causes him to, to react, and he even begins to cuss to prove that he wasn't with Jesus. Just sometimes just to assure everybody, you know, maybe young folks whenever they're in school, sometimes just to make sure everybody understands that you don't go to church, you'll act like they act and do as they do and talk as they talk because sometimes the pressure is just too much. Uh, sometimes you'll go to the bar and have a drink and, and sleep around just just to maybe prove to somebody else that no, 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 I, I, I don't know Jesus, sometimes guilt and shame will cause you to want to run away so fast that you'll even commit sin to make you'll even sometimes commit sin to prove to the world that you're not godly the curse words to to the the crowd was to proclaim I, I don't know who Jesus is suddenly he was worried about his own high he was worried about his own life. Earlier when he said, I will not deny you, it was about Jesus. It's easy to profess Jesus when you're in church. It's easy to profess Jesus and listen to worship music when you're at home. It's another thing when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at college, and all of the pressure of life. Everybody else is at the party. Everybody else is sleeping. Everybody else is doing drugs. Everybody else is drinking. And now they're ridiculing you and making fun of you, and you are at a crossroads needing to make a decision. It's easy to say to Jesus in church, Lord, you are the light of my life, and, and Lord, Lord, you cause light to come into shadows. But when you go to work and everybody's cussing and everybody's, everybody's talking about cheating on their wife and, and when you're at the store and nobody's looking and there's the product that you don't have money to, to pay for, it's easy, it's easy when you're around other believers to say, Lord, I'll never deny you. It's another thing when you're around sin. This brave, strong man who promised just a few hours ago, boy, don't time fly. Just a few hours ago, he said, I'll never, I'll never deny you. This brave man is now willing to do whatever it takes to distance himself from the Jews' king. Immediately, the rooster crowed and anguish became his companion. Remorseful failure. I'm going to say those words again. Remorseful failure now feels his broken soul. He remembers the warning that Jesus gave him in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, when Jesus said, Simon, Satan has asked for you. I need some folks in this room to understand that sometimes Satan will ask for you. He said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But if you are a child of God, there's another verse. Come on, come on. Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Come on. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Look at that verse. Even when Satan has asked for you, some of you have been on a path, including myself, that you don't understand, you don't know how you got there, and you don't want to be on that path anymore. If Jesus could say anything to you today, he would say, Satan has asked for you, but stand firm like a tree planted by the water because I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Don't give up on me now because I'm not finished with you yet. Come on, somebody. Peter is consumed with guilt and shame. It's easy to feel good when the preacher's preaching to you. It's another thing when you're consumed with guilt and shame. Peter's consumed as, as Jesus is tortured and as Jesus is even crucified. Peter, along with the other disciples, now they seem lost. They, they don't know what to do, but you know what happens every day? We may not know what to do, but every stinking morning I'm, I'm woken by the sound of a rooster. 
every day I've got something that reminds me of what I've done wrong. Trying to love God, trying to do what's right, trying to help the church, but I cannot get away from the constant reminders of what I did yesterday. Something always reminds me of what I don't like about myself. Peter wakes up every day to the sound of a rooster. Contemplating what to do next. The disciples, they meet privately. Why privately? Because people are looking for them. They meet privately to discuss their future and suddenly, suddenly attention is drawn to the noise of someone running toward their hideout. Suddenly everybody grips the seat of their chair because they don't know what happens. And all of a sudden the door slams open and Mary runs in and Mary says, guys, he is gone. And they look at each other and Mary says, his body is not in the tomb. And Mary shouts out and says, he is risen. And all of the disciples, can you imagine the excitement in the room? Can you imagine what it must have been in that moment as they all suddenly remember, he said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it back up. And Andrew and James and, and, and Bartholomew and Thaddeus, and they're all sitting there and they're, they're all excited. He's not in the tomb. What, what happened? Oh, but, but wait. Everybody's excited, Pastor shouted, Jesus is alive. But you can't get excited when you think to yourself, there's a stupid rooster still crowing. Wait, wait, wait. I'm excited, but I'm not real sure what to do because I hear a rooster crowing. I'm in church this morning and I see all these people raising their hands and worshiping God, but they don't know where I've been. All these people are flooding the altars and I don't know this team that's singing and I want to raise my hands, but, but they don't know what's been in my life lately. They don't know the stuff that I keep going back to. They, they don't know my activities. I, I want to, he, he's alive and P, Peter is thinking to himself, I, I'm, I'm glad he's alive, but, but, but I, I just failed him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the excitement quickly becomes, what, what, do I, what do I do now? Now that I'm in church and, and everybody else is, what if, what if they point me out? What if God tells them what I've done? I failed him. I denied him. I was the one closest to him, and I failed him. We have a room saturated with people that I'm sure that many have felt this same way. I want to raise my hands, but I just failed you. I want to worship you, but I denied you. I've sinned against you. And, And Peter sits in this room filled with the disciples and all the other disciples are cheering and, and clapping their hands and, and Peter sits back in this nervous wreck thinking he's alive but, but he will shun me. What have I done? How many times have I gotten on bended knees and said, Lord, what have I, what have I done? What have I done? Peter thinking to himself, I'm glad he's alive, but I'm no good to him anymore. You ever thought to yourself, I'd love to go back to church, but I'm no good to them anymore. But I've got news for you today. He's not finished with me. You need to declare today, he's not finished with me. John chapter 21, follow me there real quick. John chapter 21, look at verse number 15. And it would say this, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes. Come on. 
Do you love me? Whew. And he said, more than these. And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And he said to him a, a second time, Simon, how many, uh, somebody say a second time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend to my sheep. And he said to him a third time, say third time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And, and Peter was grieved. You see, in that moment when he's grieving, it's coming back to him. I failed him. Peter was grieved because he said, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The restoration of Peter is Jesus saying, I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with you. Come on. In his weakness, Peter denied Jesus three times. In weakness, he failed three times. But on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, weakness and failure met mercy and grace. Weakness and failure met mercy and grace. Weakness and failure met mercy and grace. Your weakness and your failure can meet his mercy and his grace. Three times he failed and three times he was restored. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? This is agape love. This is a love that Webster is yet to be able to properly define. This is a, this is a godly love. Each time, listen to me, broken saints of God, worried saints of God, guilty saints of God, failing saints of God. Listen to me. Each time Peter proclaimed his love for Jesus, mercy and grace covered his sin. Mercy and grace covered his weakness. Mercy and grace covered his failure. <laughs> Fully restored, Jesus gives him the same instruction that he gave him three and a half years ago. Follow me but Lord I have failed you son it's in the past follow me Lord I've sinned against you I know but that was yesterday and you repented of it follow me Lord but what's the world going to say about me don't worry what the world's going to say because I'm not finished with you yet <laughs> Woo, his love Moses, Moses had a lot of doubt, but God declared, I'm not finished yet. Jacob lied, and he was a deceiver, but God declared, I'm not finished with you yet. David was full of lust and envy and caused a man to be murdered, but God said, I'm not finished with you yet. Ruth literally in the Bible and physically lost all that she had, but God said, I'm not finished with you yet. Amen. Come on. Elijah became weak in his faith, but God said, I'm not finished with you yet. Job lost everything he had and he came near death. But God stepped in and said, I'm not finished with you yet. Three Hebrew boys cast into a furnace. But a fourth man walked in and said, I'm not finished with you. <laughs> Daniel tossed into the lion's den looking looking lions eye to eye, but God sent an angel that said, he's not finished with you yet. Mary Magdalene once possessed with devils, but Jesus stepped in and said, the woman at the well committing repeated adultery and Jesus said if you drink from that water you'll thirst again but if you drink from the water that I give you you'll never thirst again Jesus said I know you've been in sin but in my weakness in my shame in my guilt in my failure in my sin He's not finished with me yet. Weakness, shame, guilt, 
failure, Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, Yet in these things, everybody say, my things. things. Yet in all of these things we are more. Come on. You are what? Come on. The devil has told you that you're worthless. But the word of God declares that you are what? You came in this morning feeling like a failure. You're watching me right now feeling like a failure. But God declares in Romans chapter 8 verse 37 what? For I am persuaded. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, things to come, height, depth, any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You hear what that's telling you this morning? You might have failed over and over and over and over, but none of your failures can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus your Lord. Don't raise your hand. How many of you in this room, don't raise your hand, have felt recently like you're a failure? How many of you recently have felt like you're constantly overtaken by your weakness? I'm preaching to you. Stop telling yourself he's talking to somebody else. No, I'm not talking to the Christians who seem like they've got it all together right now. Some people are on a mountain, and some of y'all ain't on a mountain, West Virginia style. I'm preaching to you that have been going through it. You look in that mirror, and you say to yourself, I'm not worth what I think I am. God is telling you this morning to stop believing that lie because I'm not finished with you yet. First Peter 5 and 10 would say this, that in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have what? Oh, count it all joy. After you have suffered a little while, I'm preaching to those of you that feel like a failure, feel like you're overcome by your weakness. This is for you. After you have suffered a little while, he will what? Come on, somebody preach it with me. He will restore you. Come on, those of you feel like a failure, you ready to be restored today? He will restore you. He will what? He's going to support you. He's going to strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. I declare over you this morning, people in this room that have felt broken, that have felt lost, that have felt like failures, that God, my good Lord Almighty, God is going to restore you. He's going to support you. He's going to strengthen you. And he's going to place you on a firm foundation. He will not leave you alone. You are not an unfinished product. You are not a mistake. You. I'm going to prove something to you right now. You ready? You ready? When I was praying in the spirit this morning, I walked through this room and I walked to that wall. You see that big wall right there? Nothing fancy about that wall. Quite plain, to be honest with you. I walked to that wall right there, and the Holy Ghost got on me, and I began to speak in a godly language, and the Spirit of God began to talk to me. Follow me, camera. Follow me. You see that wall? Do you see anything wrong with that wall? Looks like a perfect wall, doesn't it? But you see, if you get over here real close... I got right here and the Holy Ghost got on me because right there is a big old mark, a big old dent. Somebody took something and damaged our drywall. Woo! But the Lord said to me, walk away from it. And I began to walk away from it. 
And the further I got away from my blemish and the closer I got to him, I couldn't see it anymore. The closer I get to him and the further I get away from that blemish, that old blemish doesn't matter anymore. Stand with me if you would. Listen, that imperfection that's driving you crazy, That imperfection that you think is keeping you from God is only keeping you from God because you've got your magnifying glass out looking at that imperfection. Your heavenly Father says today, stop looking at your imperfection and look at me. Three times. I'm trying to be done three times. Deuteronomy 31, Joshua 1, Hebrews chapter 13. He declared a promise over you. I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I don't want to stand up here and try to put on a fancy suit to make you think I've all got I've got it all together. I stood here last week. If you weren't here, that's too bad for you. I stood here last week and I told this congregation that I've been at the edge of breaking down. I've been at the, at the edge of too much. Today is your day to say, though the world calls me a failure, though my past says I'm too shameful, Though my divorce tells me that I'm not good enough. Though my weight causes me to to be in shame. I filed for bankruptcy. I lost my job. I, I, I committed this horrible thing years ago. Your heavenly father is ready to say that hurt, that shame, that failure, that guilt. You need to let it go. You need to let it go. Because he's not finished with you yet. He's not done with you yet. You, you take, I've been hearing this a lot lately in my spirit. You take that towel that you had folded and you were ready to throw in that towel. You take that towel, you fold it, you take it home and put it away and you tell your God, thank you for not giving up on me and I won't give up on you. I thought about giving up, but today's not the day. I thought about giving in, but today's not the day.